Welcome. Welcome to the uh, April 10th board meeting here at Emerson uh, Elementary School. Ms. Hutchison, will you please call the roll? Here. 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 Mr. Chirpy, would you lead us in the pledge, please? All right, uh, we're here for communication with the host school. Dr. Schuler, could you introduce Ms. Debbie Klein, please? I'd be happy to. I think she's standing on, oh, there she is, sitting on the other side of the podium. I, <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Debbie Klein, who will offer the, the welcome from the host school. So um, I think we say often we are absolutely blessed in District 200 to have phenomenal principals who lead our buildings. Uh, Mrs. Klein is absolutely uh, one of them. So, uh, Mrs. Klein, I, I won't, uh, I won't make you sad before you start. I but I, I don't want to cry. I, okay. But please give us the welcome okay. tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Um, in the fall of 1990, I was a student teacher at Hawthorne Elementary School. And since that time, I've worked in five different buildings, taught every, grade, every elementary grade level, been three different types of specialists, and three different roles. And the only reason I share that with you is just to illustrate something, that I love learning, I love working with children, and I love working with children in different capacities. However, despite my love of mixing things up, there was one constant in my life for the past 34 years. In every one of these roles, I was an employee of District 200. Before I turn over the microphone to the very important presenters we have tonight, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Board of Education, the senior leadership team, the countless colleagues, families, students, who have been a part of my story and have allowed me to be part of theirs. It has been both an honor and a privilege. I especially want to recognize the staff and PTA members that have joined us tonight for their tireless love and dedication to students. So if they would please stand. Now I will be quiet so the important people you can hear. I am going to turn this presentation over to our student council who created it just for you. Welcome, Board of Education, staff, students, and community members. We are representatives from the Emerson Student Council and we are excited to tell you a little bit of our Emerson story and how we all together are a part of the Book of Emerson. There was a school that loved to learn, and that school was Emerson Elementary. Unlike other schools, they earned a national blue ribbon, which shows how hard they work here. But it isn't all about the work. The Emerson family loves to have fun here. And speaking of which, everyone all has a part in an important story. In each of the stories is a chapter in the book of Emerson. The prologue is Emerson's belief statement. Olivia is here to share that with you. Good evening. I'm Olivia, and I've been a student at Emerson since I was in kindergarten. At Emerson, we have some core beliefs that I would like to share with you. We believe in assuming goodness and giving grace. Taking time to play, we learn through our play. We learn to communicate, problem solve, and create and discover together. <laughs> important to laugh. We always look for opportunities to find joy. <laughs> we also believe in doing projects. In student council, we do service projects that help our school and community. In the following slides, we want to tell you the tales of Emerson and what makes us special. The tales of Emerson by Emerson Student Council. 
chapter 1, kindergarten. Chapter 2, first grade. Listen to me. This is one thing you love better. Chapter three, second grade. Chapter four, third grade. Chapter 5, fourth grade. Hi. I'm interviewing my fourth grade friend, Jayla. Jayla, what is something unique about Emerson? Something unique about Emerson is that they came in this school like 17 years and that's how you can They're a good school for like 17 years. Thank you, Jayla. Chapter 6, 5th grade. Chapter 7, Skills. Today I'm interviewing my friend, James. James, what is something that you like about Emerson? It's our home. Thank you, James.
not sure how that got in there. <laughs> Thank you for attending this evening. There you have it, the Tales of Emerson. I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation and that your meeting goes well. Thank you for coming, Board of Education, staff, students, and community members. Please have some refreshments, and thank you for having your meeting here at Emerson. And they all learned happily ever after. <laughs>If you don't mind, I'm going to let my staff and these wonderful students head out because, you know, we still have IAR testing tomorrow. So, anyway, <laughs> thank you. All right, well, uh, people are filing out. We're going to keep going. Board, any modifications to the agenda tonight? I think we have just one modification. We wanted to add an item for a closed session. I think it's item 10 off your list, just matters involving an individual student. Correct. Got it. So that's 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 part T part N. For those who want to add it. Uh, we're at a public comment session. Nobody has signed up for public comment tonight. So we're going to continue on with our agenda to the superintendent report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hanlon. Just a few things that I wanted to share with the, the board and community this evening uh, before I turn it over to our student ambassadors to do our, our high school student reports. Um, I'm going to go down a list of some things that I jotted down that I wanted to make sure I shared. I think uh, you heard a lot in the communication from the host school today, uh, a lot of gratitude. And so we're entering that season of the school year where we've got a lot of celebratory events to both thank and uh, express gratitude to those that make this uh, school district special and unique. Um, one of them that I wanted to highlight uh, this morning, I had the pleasure of uh, hosting two volunteers uh, in our community for a volunteer reception that uh, the Illinois Association of School Administrators puts on uh, every year. The two guests that I, uh, I brought with me today, one was Jennifer Merck. Jennifer is the immediate past president of the Student Excellence Foundation, and I think as I shared this morning in the event, I think Jennifer has done about every volunteer job you could possibly imagine uh, in the school district, certainly over the 10 years that, uh, that I have been here, but, but especially what she's done um, through the Student Excellence Foundation. So I, I thank Jennifer. I also had a chance to invite Joey Camp uh, Joey, you might remember, was one of the Lincoln parents that kind of helped us launch the playground replacement cycle. So Joey and a group of uh, parents came together, really came to the district to say, how could we partner to approach this playground project? And what came out of that conversation was the playbook and a commitment uh, over a six-year period to update all of our playgrounds uh, across the district. Joey's also on our, our community engagement leadership team as well, and, and so uh, again, it was nice to honor and thank both of them. I um, wanted to mention and remind the community, as I just talked about uh, Jennifer, that the Student Excellence Foundation has one of their big events coming up on April the 25th, and that's their Celebrate Our Stars event. Um, we're so appreciative of the foundation for uh, taking the time to create a venue to recognize uh, staff, um, which they'll do that evening. Uh, phenomenal uh, night of pizza and celebration as well. So um, I would encourage everybody to attend that April 25th uh, at uh, Wheaton North. Uh, coming up on May 6th before our next uh, board meeting as well, we will do our annual recognition event in the district for uh, our staff that are, are celebrating 15 years of service to district, 225 years of service. Uh, and sadly, some of our staff that will be retiring, we're happy for them that they're retiring. Sad for, uh, uh, for us, certainly. We have 41 uh, members of the learning community that are retiring uh, this year. Uh, now I will make her cry a little bit, Debbie being one of them. We're going to miss you so much, Debbie. I can kind of see you behind the, uh, the, the podium. But uh, we, are, we are so thankful for the opportunity to uh, recognize our staff that uh, have given both years of service and their entire careers to, uh, to District 200. Um, that will take place at Wheat Warrenville South uh, this year. Uh, May 1st, uh, I believe it's at Wheaton North this year, uh, is our incubator final pitch uh, night. So coming up in the next uh, 
uh, week. Our, our schools will be doing their, uh, their final pitches through their individual classes, and they bring together uh, a group from each of the high schools, a couple groups from each of the high schools to compete in the final pitch uh, competition, which uh, um, we are really excited about. Um, a thank you uh, to uh, Julie Ozemkowski staff at the School Service Center and all of our building staff. We are right in the throes of state testing uh, season. Today was, uh, was our, our state testing day at both of our high schools. Um, it's kind of over the start of this week, and as uh, we continue uh, uh, here for a little while longer, we're doing uh, our state testing uh, at uh, all of our elementary, middle schools uh, as well. Uh, it takes a lot to set up on the front end to hopefully ensure that that goes uh, smoothly, and um, we are really thankful for uh, Julie and, and uh, her, her work to support that. Um, just a quick reminder, we publish every year a fine arts uh, calendar, and there's some great opportunities coming up. Uh, our musicals coming up at uh, both high schools. Um, consider attending those. Actually, as I just left uh, Wheaton Warrenville South uh, tonight from a couple of their senior night activities, there was a, a big South Side ba band uh, evening that was coming in at, uh, at South. Uh, so lots, uh, lots going on, and, and certainly... Um, we encourage, invite our, our community to take advantage of that. Um, and then uh, I have just uh, three more uh, that I want to mention. Uh, actually, four more, sorry, that I want to mention. And I'll move on one. Um, PTA Council, another uh, amazing organization, supports our, our district through all of our PTAs, has coming up their scholarship uh, event. So thankful for the work that they do to uh, provide scholarships, and it's a nice opportunity to to bring students together from uh, actually both of our high schools, kind of representing all of our schools and, and PTAs. Um, amazing uh, thing that I just want to highlight from, from last week. So uh, if, if you followed it all on social media, you've probably seen a little bit about the Franklin Dodgeball event, which has slowly taken on a life of its own as that uh, event has grown uh, over the years. But really has two parts to it. So there's a student opportunity at the dodgeball event, and then separate from that, uh, really Mr. Kish is the, the big push behind that. He does a, a hero night where uh, first responder groups uh, come together and, and compete. Uh, and, and there's, a, there's a, a, a charity kind of local connection uh, event to that. And I, and I just want to highlight that uh, one of the organizations that was a benefactor uh, of the dodgeball tournament this year was Cam and Can, um, which a uh, very, very local uh, charity and group. And, and so as they presented the check at the dodgeball event, uh, Mr. Kish brought up to kind of center court before it started um, two of the first responder groups that have been incredibly involved and, and influential uh, with, uh, with the family, but also uh, he had a, a group of, uh, gosh, I think there were about 20 educators, Mr. Biscuit, I think they're there. Um, that uh, had worked uh, with uh, with Cammy uh, through her school experience in in District 200, uh, and they came out uh, to to greet the family as well. Just an incredibly moving moment, uh, certainly, and uh, really was uh, was a as you see, it was a, a phenomenal moment for uh, our school community. I know it was difficult, but uh, very moving. So uh, thank you to Joe and all the faculty at uh, Franklin and other schools that. Um, we're part of that event. And then the very last thing um, is that I want to introduce two new administrators uh, this evening. Um, we have uh, with us this evening one administrator that was actually approved at your last uh, meeting, but we didn't get a chance to introduce him, and that's Ryan Ferguson. Ryan, I don't know where you are. Please stand up. So Ryan uh, is currently at uh, Wheaton North. <laughs> but he, he's going to be he's going to be shedding his uh, his his blue and yellow and uh, and instead going to South next year to be a new assistant uh, principal. So he's trading the blue and yellow for some black and orange next year. So, uh, Mr. Ferguson, not uh, welcome, but welcome to the new role. Excited to have you. Um, and then also pleased to introduce uh, Patrick Graft, who's here. Patrick, would you mind standing up? So, uh, Patrick is going to be the new assistant principal at Bauer uh, for next year. So uh, excited to uh, to have you. So, and that uh, that's my report. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, sorry, not all my report because now I want to introduce my student ambassadors. Yeah, right. So, 
Uh, I don't know who's, uh, who's, who's starting us off this evening. Let's go to Wheat North first. All right. So as you heard, today was the SAT, PSAT day for everyone else except for the seniors. So that was a nice day off if you were a senior, not so much if you were anyone else. Um, but the winter play at Wheaton North Badger, they won their sectional a couple weeks ago and they advanced to the state where they placed fifth. Uh, and Mamma Mia! The Musical, as you heard, is just now in full throttle for their performances in late April. Uh, Winter Guard plays second at the Midwest Color Guard Circuit Finals. Boys Lacrosse uh, is one of eight teams that remains undefeated in the state. Girls Track and Field will host their 37th annual Blue and Gold Invitational uh, Friday the 12th. Uh, and then the Co-op Boys Gymnastics will host the Dave Donaldson Invite this Saturday at South. Uh, the varsity team remains undefeated in dual meets as well. Girls Softball went 4-0 on their trip to Florida, where they also visited Disney World over spring break. And the math team traveled to state uh, at ISU on April 6th. Thank you, Ethan. And Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to just go ahead and start off with saying, Mr. Ferguson, you made an excellent choice. I know Wheaton North is a little treacherous, so welcome to Wheaton South. <laughs> and then to go into some of the positives, um, I would like to start off by saying our spring sports are in full spring. Uh, spring sports are in full swing, so we're very excited. Uh, you can feel the competitive nature all throughout our school, and I think it really does bring the vibe of school up. People are excited for after school, so they show up for school, which is pretty good, especially because senioritis has also kicked in, I gotta be honest. Uh, <laughs> in addition, Cabaret with our show choir was a huge success and a great way to end off such a successful season. Um, I'd really like to give a shout out to the show choir. For years, they have brought tons of joy and life to our school community and um, everything they do for South, again, it just lifts the mood up and builds into the tiger spirit. Uh, so we also worked with the Northern Illinois Food Pantry donations. Um, and I know some of the members of Wheaton South Key Club and other volunteer organizations helped load trucks and get that food out to people in need. Uh, in addition, there was a senior night for badminton tonight, and also there was a fundraiser in which I lost 25 to zero to my friend Tirsa, uh, and they raised a lot of money for the team. <laughs> Uh, seniors are starting to celebrate the end of the year, maybe a little too early. So I'd like to say thank you to anyone who decided that uh, SAT day was not a day we had to go to because I slept until noon. Uh, <laughs> math team won 12 in state. We've had some field trips going off. Uh, I just want to stress the importance of out of the classroom learning, especially because not only do you get outside of school, but you get to go make connections. Uh, I, w I was lucky enough to attend uh, the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab field trip for the anatomy classes, and I was very excited. Tomas actually went on the AP Euro field trip to the Art Institute, and continuously we are getting students outside of the classroom, which I really do, uh, do think helps with the educational experience. To end it off here, science classes got to view the solar eclipse. Thank you to Mr. Press, our department chair, for putting that all together. Um, and then on top of all of that, I'd like to say there was a lot going on at Wheaton South last month, and to the people who really provided support and positive feedback and also some constructive criticism to our school, we want to say thank you and that our school's energy is building back up because like I said last meeting we are a resilient school and we're not going to crumble just because something small happens we got this thank you we're ready to end off the year strong thank you both that's it all right thank you uh, we're on to the consent agenda so I'm going to read the items um, the items included on tonight's consent agenda are acceptance of gift to Wheaton North High School the girls softball program acceptance of gift to Wheaton North High School Boys Cross Country, acceptance of gift to Wheaton Warrenville South High School Athletics, acceptance of gift to Wheaton Warrenville South High School Chess Team, approval to post grades four to five plus curriculum content for community review, approval to post high school novels for community review, approval of food service management company contract, approval of one year contract extension with Baker Tilly, our auditor, approval of snack vending contract renewal, Approval of the Fortinet firewall upgrade. Approval of the no before cybersecurity training. Approval of VMware renewal. Approval of bills payable and payroll. Approval of minutes March 13, 2024, regular meeting open and closed. And approval to destroy recordings of closed sessions prior to November 2022 as allowable by law. Approval of personnel report to include employment, resignation, retirement, and leave of absence of administrative, certified, classified, and non-union staff. Board, are there any items that board members want removed from the consent agenda? All right, hearing none, Dr. Schuler. Uh, no additional information other than what was already provided. 
Board, any questions or comments? I need approval of the consent agenda. Uh -huh. well, we'll get there. <laughs> no questions or comments. Okay. Um, board, I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. Just moved. Just moved. Moved by Mr. Rutledge. Proactively. Second. Second by Ms. Cullivan. Uh, Ms. Hutchison, will you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Under our action items, we have seven action items on the agenda tonight. Our first one is approval of transportation contract extension with Illinois Central Bus LLC. Dr. Schuler. Yeah, so three of your uh, uh, seven items are actually items that uh, we held off of last month's uh, agenda, and I think the, the board did that at the request couple of a couple board members who wanted to spend some time at Finance Committee really making sure we went through and understood those items. So uh, I guess uh, uh, before we consider just that item, uh, Dave and or Eric from Finance Committee, it's probably a decent time to just kind of give a quick Finance Committee report since that was really largely the basis, just anything either of you want to share for, for the balance of the board before we move into the action. I'll go and then you can follow. Yeah, so um, yeah, we had our meeting on the 4th and probably more than 90% of the meeting was sent, spent on the three contract items. So um, appreciate the work that um, um, Dr. O'Keefe, uh, Ms. Maher and uh, Jordan Thorst put in. They, they presented a lot of information and it was, um, um, kind of well vetted out. The, the highlights are, you know, there, there's some significant cost increases in there, um, but the there, there's a couple things that get us comfortable, I guess, with where we are, and that is, um, number one, it's, it's largely a labor-driven issue. So like every, you know, like all businesses, they're having trouble attracting um, talent. Uh, the other thing that was pretty eye-opening is the comparatives to other districts, to comparable districts in the community. We're significantly lower. And there's uh, factors to it besides just negotiating it. You know, there's a lot that goes into it. And I guess that's the other comment I'd have that for these contracts are pretty complex and there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and so, it, you know, they, they're, um, again, all the increase is really labor driven. The other um, big item was, um, it's one of the items, right, the, the fuel. So we're going to take over the purchasing of the fuel for the buses. So there's tanks in the yard. And right now we pay for that gas and we pay um, surcharges when the costs go up and we pay sales tax. By us taking over those costs, we eliminate the sales tax. And we also have the ability to, um, I don't know, hedge isn't the right word, but maybe it is, but to lock in a contract rate. So um, working with our, our um, consultants, we can um, eliminate some of the upside on the cost. And while we have really good partners, there's not a lot of incentive for them to do that because the cost just gets passed on to us. So where we can save it, we get to put it in our pockets. Um, those are the highlights I had. I don't know if you have anything to add, Eric. Well, the only other things I would add with the regular <coughs> transportation, uh, again, just the marketplace dynamics, there's essentially you know, two players in the marketplace, which um, you know creates a challenging situation. Um, but again, while the percentage increases look large compared to comparables, our rates are are good. Um, and then I just wanted to you know, express appreciation for the the creativity on the fuel agreement. Um, we did explore whether that could be applied to the special ed or taxi transportation. There's not a practical way to do that. Um, but even just for the regular transportation, uh, the savings are very material. Re real quick. Um the board is our in our role of governance, right, and oversight. Uh, we think about process, which is probably something you guys want to look into. Can you comment on the on that a little bit? I know Dr. O'Keefe updated us multiple times, so I know it wasn't a short process. But did you look at the process or talk about the process? Yes, and um, you know we reviewed both the the legalities of um, contract extensions rather than going out to to bid, but also um, from a um, you know district process perspective, uh, kind of the decision that led us to there. Um, we did talk a little bit about whether there are um, you know, opportunities to earlier on decide whether it's right to go out to bid or to consider extensions. But again, the, the process outline made sense. Um, and even the, the fact that this was removed from last meeting's agenda to allow further time for review, I think, uh, demonstrated the, the appropriate approach to governance. Thank you. 
So I'm not, I'm, even though it's not specific to this, I did have a couple other comments on the finance committee. I might as well just knock those out now, or should but I do that why at don't the Let's end? do this. Let's take care of this action, and then we'll, we, we, we can do come that back at the end. When, end okay, after very good. Thanks. All right. Dr. Schuler, you want to introduce the topic? Any additional information? Yeah, there's really no additional information, I think, other than what was provided to the board and, and really vetted through your, your finance committee from our side. Which is also on the website? Correct. Excellent. Any uh, additional questions from the board or comments? All right. Uh, board, I need a motion and a second to approve the three-year transportation contract extension with Illinois Central School Bus as presented. So motioned. Moved by Mr. Jerpy. Second? Second. Second by Mr. Long. Ms. Hutchison, will you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Action item number two, approval of fuel purchasing agreement between CUSD 200 and Blue Petroleum. Dr. Schuler? Uh, again, really no additional information. I think you heard from the, the Finance Committee. One, I want to express appreciation to Dr. O'Keefe, who really uh, kind of led the creative look at the, at this to, again, recognize the, the fact that we've seen some increase in that contract, but it's a way uh, for us to uh, certainly attempt to, to be as uh, responsible as we can fiscally. So um, I, I don't think any additional information, Dr. O'Keefe, unless you had anything you wanted to add. The only piece is Blue Petroleum is the existing firm that works with Illinois Central, so it only made sense to use that firm since they're, they're supplying Illinois Central and the Carroll Stream site now. It's a one-year contract. So if things don't work exactly the way that we would anticipate and that we can we believe are going to happen, we've got the ability to, to shift the maneuver for beyond next year. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Comments? So the price we pay when we purchase fuel, um, I know we've talked about hedging the cost. Are we paying the market rate at the time? Um, or is it we're paying a rate and if it goes up, we're protected? W yes. So to the latter, we, we, with Blue Petroleum and all the conversations that I've had so far, they would be comfortable with us locking in 90% of our anticipated consumption for next year, which sets the floor for us. If we need to spot buy below that because pricing is better, we have the ability to do so. But if the market goes up, we are you are protected from the pricing side of things. We can still take advantage of potential, although unlikely, price decreases. Yeah. Uh, but we're protected on the upside. Okay. And, and while that's an opportunity, uh, the kind of the guaranteed savings on this is the surcharge avoidance and the sales tax avoidance. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? The other thing I appreciate is our survey of what's going on in the marketplace with other districts and other areas. I know there was extensive conversation from Dr. O'Keefe's relationship in the in the area to make a ton of sense and a huge value for us. So that was really helpful as well. All right. Uh, no further questions. Board I need a motion and a second to approve the move to direct fuel purchasing and the one year fuel purchasing agreement between CUSD two hundred and Blue Petroleum as presented. So moved. Moved by Ms. Blatt. Second. Second by Mr. Rutledge. Ms. Hutchison, please call the roll. Yes. 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 Action item number three, approval of intergovernmental fuel purchasing agreement between CUSD 200 and Keeneville School District 20. Dr. Schuler. Um, so I'm offering a thank you to Dr. O'Keefe and the board from the Board of Education at, uh, at Keeneville. So they share a yard with us. And so the intergovernmental agreement allows us to extend the purchasing to uh, the, the fuel that will drive their buses as well. So that's why this is necessary. Again, I think like Dr. O'Keefe mentioned, um, with our purchasing agreement, uh, we, we are only locking into this intergovernmental agreement for a year. So if something were not to work out with this, you are not locked into this over an extended period of time. So I cover that accurately. Good job. All right. <laughs> Any other Thank you from Keeneville. Good. Any questions from the board? Comments? Did I understand there was going to be some kind of a uh, um, charge to Keeneville for purchasing this? Yeah. You go ahead, Doc. Yeah, correct. I actually spoke with my counterpart today. Their finance committee met yesterday. Meeting went as planned, positive feedback uh, for the move 
both short term and long term. My counterpart and I, we just have to work out what it is. We we think just a, a small flat fee on a monthly basis from an administrative fee side of things will work. She's completely open to it. We'll set, figure out what that dollar amount looks like and then build that in as a memo of understanding or letter of understanding to the IGA. Thank you. Any additional questions? Are there other kind of examples of school districts partnering in this fashion that you know of? In this area, uh, no. Central, Southern Illinois, yes. In fact, um, this whole conversation started with Bloomington. Uh, I forget their school district number. 87. Is it, it's Bloomington 87. So my counterpart down there, I found out about this when we were beginning our renewal conversations with Illinois Central. Heard that Bloomington 87 was doing this on their own. Had extensive conversations with my counterpart down there. They have their own tanks, so it's a little bit different from their perspective. But they said specifically, yes, what you should be able to do in terms of hedging, price locking, whatever it may be, plus the savings and the sales tax and giving control over something. And then the big thing for us is removing the fuel surcharge. We're now in control and, and have removed uh, a big portion of the contract, which was costly for us, that it made a lot of sense. So Central Illinois, Southern Illinois, because of the expansive nature of those districts, where school districts are buying fuel on their own. Yeah, and you might realize this, but we're, they're the only other district in that yard with us. And that was one of the things is why would we do it? Well, it, it simplifies the whole process, right? As opposed to trying to figure out how do you separate the gas that we're buying from them. And so that's why we partner with them. Is, isn't that accurate? Yeah, I mean, in essence, we'd have to purchase some new tanks so that they, Keneville, Keneville could have their fuel, we could have our fuel, but it doesn't make sense. And the benefit afforded to us as a government body obviously extends to Keneville too. And it also helps, it helped them with their renewal, so. I have one quick question regarding any, any of these topics mm -hmm. in transportation. Is our fuel consumption fairly predictable year over year? It is. That's what I thought, okay, thank you. And in fact, when we go out and hedge or price lock, we, we we actually will lock in a certain number of gallons per month. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Just to clarify, so the the negotiated negotiation of the administrative fee for Keneville, that's purely to cover some administration administration uh, administration costs, correct? Like there's no revenue producing side to that. Mi minimal. Um, really, just yeah, a little bit of time associated with producing a bill and processing the information as it comes through. Yeah. Um, th there's no need to consider any of my time because we're gonna do this anyhow on our own. So all we're doing is changing the fuel numbers. I and it's no no new work for me beyond what is being put in place. So just something small to cover a light cost on the administrative side for us, that's all. So the cost that we pay for the fuel is the cost that we will you know, We'll charge, charge for the fuel, yes. Be okay. Because that this the DuPage County tax and the Illinois sales tax, which will not be charged to us, benefit both districts. Okay, okay. thank you. Any other questions, board? Uh, I'd just like to comment. I appreciate the creative solution. You know, the, the budget's got hundreds and hundreds of lines, and we're looking at all the lines, and this is a great solution. I would just comment that this kind of work among government entities rather common within the municipalities and the cities do this kind of thing a lot. Agreed. All right, board, I need a motion and a second to approve the Intergovernmental Fuel Purchasing Agreement between CUSD 200 and Keneville School District 20 as presented. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Paulson, seconded by Mr. Rutledge. Ms. Hutchison? Yes. 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 Action item number four, approval of transportation contract extension with Sunrise Southwest LLC. Dr. Schuler. Yeah, no additional information. I think uh, Mr. Long and Mr. Jerpy really covered, covered this through uh, time that was spent with finance committee. So I'd recommend you move forward with the next two. Board, any questions or comments? Could you just clarify for the full board the cost share when the, the students are being bused under McKinney-Vento from one district to another? Yeah, actually, probably Dr. Sloggy could most accurately describe that. Yeah, uh, 
the cost share portion of it. Anytime a student who qualifies for McKinney Vento status, which is determination of homeless status, um, if they are living uh, or have an unstable home uh, situation outside of our district and still attending one of our district schools, we have a cost share agreement with uh, the district where they may be residing. Uh, an example of that would be maybe they have an unstable home situation and they're living with a relative uh, for a certain amount of time. We could have a cost share agreement with wherever that school district is where they're at to share the cost of um, the transportation and it goes vice versa. Uh, there could be students attending an outside school but they're living within Whedon. We have a responsibility to cost share with them um, for, our, uh, for our citizens taxi dispatch. 50-50 split. And then also with regard to making an event, there had been a question at the finance committee meeting from a community member around how many students were covered by that from a transportation perspective. I don't have the number in front of me, but Dr. Schuler, do you recall? Yeah, Dr. slotty has got it. Yeah, so uh, under McKinney Vento right now in the district, we have 315 total students that we serve. We transport presently through uh, our taxi service 71 of those students in 56 of our cabs. So that number, there's probably some, there's some siblings that are transporting. So you have 71 of the McKin students who qualify for McKinney Vento status uh, being transported. Thank you. I just thought that would be useful information for the board and the community. Any additional questions, board? All right. Board, I need a, uh, a motion and a second to approve the three-year transportation contract extension with Sunrise Southwest LLC as presented. So moved. Moved by Mr. Paulson. Second. Second by Mr. Long. Ms. Hutchison, will you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Action item number five, approval of single student and small group student transportation services contract extension with Citizens Taxi Dispatch, Inc. Dr. Schuler. No additional information. Board, any questions or comments? Hearing none, board, I need a motion and a second to approve the two-year transportation contract extension with Citizens Taxi Dispatch, Inc. as presented. So moved. Moved by Mr. Rutledge. Second. Second by Mr. Paulson. Ms. Hutchison. Yes. 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 Action item number six, adoption of resolution authorizing non-reemployment of full-time first, second, and third year non-tenured certified staff. Dr. Schuler. Yeah, so just a reminder of the board, the next two items, uh, this is an annual uh, process that you go through, This uh, the one that you're considering right now. Uh, we employ a number of individuals on one-year contract, generally either because they're covering a leave of absence for somebody that is intended to return uh, or covering some other short-term need within the, the district. So these are honorable uh, dismissals. These are not performance. Uh, release and in many of these cases we, we may be bringing hopefully we'll be bringing a number of these individuals back as uh, staffing plans get solidified and really uh, return from uh, leave of absences uh, get finalized so uh, again this is uh, an annual process but I just want to clarify the next two these are honorable dismissals or any questions or comments and last piece if you do not take this step you would be automatically reemploying these individuals whether we had a job for them or not. So from a budget perspective, well, I know it never feels good to release individuals. From a budget perspective, you need to do this to ensure that uh, you are not carrying extra staff in your budget. Thank you, Dr. Schuler. Board, any questions or comments? This, this is, my understanding is this is a pretty, it's a common approach that every school district takes this time of the year, so we're not yeah, you're doing not, something that's abnormal. You're, you're not unique. I would venture to guess most districts are are doing this, unless they have a really unique situation, perhaps a smaller district where they really don't have a leave, so. Board, any additional questions? All right, um, board, I need a motion and a second to approve the adoption of the resolution authorizing non-reemployment of full-time, first, second, and third year non-tenured certified staff 
and authorizing notification according to the requirements of the Illinois School Code Section 24-11 as presented. Yeah, Moved by Ms. Kulovitz. Second. Second by Mr. Long. Ms. Hutchison, please call the roll. Yes. 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 Action item number seven, adoption of the resolution authorizing non-reemployment of part-time, non-tenured certified staff. Dr. Schuler. Yeah, so like, like item six, uh, these are part-time individuals that we would anticipate will be back within the school district, but until the exact need or percentage time that we will need them is, uh, is determined, we have to take this step and then uh, re-employ them. Board, any questions or comments? All right, board, I need a motion and a second to approve the adoption of the resolution authorizing non and reemployment of part time, non tenured certified staff and authorizing notification according to the requirements of the Illinois School Code, Section 24 11, as presented. So moved. Moved by Mr. Gerpe. Second. Second by Mr. Rutledge. Ms. Hutchison, will you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Under oral reports, we have one oral report tonight, which is our middle school capital project discussion. Dr. Schuler? Yeah, so I'm going to bring uh, uh, Michael Dolter up to the, uh, the podium. Uh, Mr. Dolter is going to give you a, uh, an update as we continue to move toward uh, what is scheduled to be a June deliverable of your uh, concept uh, planning package. Mr. Dolter is going to give you a, a, an update on some of the work that he's been doing with his team to refine those plans, and then we're going to end the, the discussion this morning by just re or this evening by recapping uh, some of our current community engagement efforts and plans, and and projecting forward what the next couple of meetings are going to look like for you. So. Mike. Great. Thank you for the introduction, and good evening. Uh, again, Michael Dolter, Senior Project Architect with Perkins & Will. I'm um, going to be talking to you about uh, some of the work that we've been working on for the uh, middle school capital projects uh, since the last time we met with you. Uh, again, you see here the four major topic areas that we want to focus uh, all of the discussion on. We're really going to be focusing on that first one here, the program development. Um, as Dr. Schuler said, the further discussion on community development outside of our presentation here as well. So when we talk about program development, we're talking about the information that we've been gathering to add additional specificity to the diagrams that you've all seen previously before um, so that we can get as much information in, into that as possible, have more and more clarity that's, that's developed around there. So as the construction manager, Nicholas, is working on the, those, uh, their uh, refinement of their budget information, we can understand that we have a really good uh, basis of information for that. So a simplified look at what our design process has been and will continue to be as we work through this uh, stage of the project. Um, really, we've been focusing on existing conditions representation. So that's really understanding what you have in your buildings right now to a further and further degree. We've been working with user groups uh, to get uh, additional input from them, from their firsthand experience and knowledge of both how the buildings work and as how teaching and learning and other, uh, other factors of student lo daily life happen within the building's walls. Then we'll take that information, further refine the, the diagrams, add additional information to that, come back to the user groups, and then we continue this iterati iterative process of, of confirming, refining, confirming, and refining um, as we move through the design process here. Then we'll come back again, uh, as Dr. Schuler says, in June, uh, with a, 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 a further refined development concept uh, that has that budget information along with it. So looking at just a, a briefly at each one of those phases here, when we talk about existing conditions documentation, we've been out on the, on the building with our engineering teams as well as our architectural teams to observe the existing conditions, understand them further, again, drill down deeper into uh, what is uh, what is currently the condition of your buildings? Uh, we during spring break, a uh, group was out doing Matterport scanning. I'll introduce that in a little bit, and then we've been also updating a BIM model, which is a building information model uh, 
which shows the which is a 3D three-dimensional representation of the building so a digital twin of the building in some capacity and I'll, I'll explain some of the importance of that here as well so this is a little bit of a fuzzy image but the Matterport scanning is a unique uh, system in which uh, a camera comes in and is brought in and scans both the exterior and the interior of the building the benefit of this is that it gives you a real good clear understanding of what's in the building how does it work what is the current condition of that building from our perspective it allows us to uh, save time uh, when we're able to you know come into your building at any time if we have a question about what's happening in the building we can go to the the digital twin of the of the uh, Matterport scan really get a 360 view of any any component within there and understand that that's going to be something that that you're going to continue to use uh, if, uh, if for any project that you work on here that's going to be some a, a really good uh, tool for uh, any improvement project that could happen so it can live outside of this process as well it's also a good opportunity to do some before and afters where we compare uh, really uh, qualitatively what the conditions were before any improvements might be made and what could those be at the end as well so we've taken again uh, the physical measurements we've looked at the documents that we've been provided we've we're taking the information that comes from those Matterport scans and we've developed a three-dimensional model of the of the each one of the schools to a, a level of, of degree at this stage um, we'll continue to add more and more information as we as we gather more and more information to this the value here is that this is something that you know any project that you're going to work on is going to be working on within this model so this isn't just specific to the capital projects that we're looking on this is going to be living with the district and on the long term so you have that tool that you can work with us work with the additional architects additional engineers that can that may come into the facilities uh, to uh, do any work at, at any future date as well small group engagement we've had a really great opportunity to meet with all three schools um, starting with Edison then Franklin and Monroe we had full days out there um, great hospitality by each one of the schools to provide us access to their team to really sit down and talk with them about you know what are the the conditions in your uh, building right now well how is that affecting teaching and learning uh, and what can we do to improve that in the future um, all these areas we talked about at the last uh, at the, our last board meeting some specific to each building some really universal of, amongst each one of the three buildings we're going to be taking some of those universal components uh, if we talk about classrooms science lab classrooms and really looking at those on a district-wide level as we continue to develop here so that there is a continued parity between each one of the schools moving forward and we are matching up the overall district approach to curriculum with those facilities some of the more unique elements uh, and or the the sig the uh, single projects that might may occur at each one of the schools we're going to continue those discussions with this at the individual school level as well so we were able to again uh, bring and layer on that information that we gathered from the from the instructors and administrators at the schools we're going to take that information update our and add more specificity to our drawings and documents bring that information back to them again for for confirmation and, and additional clarity to the, those designs um, as we move forward here so some of the common themes that came out of our discussions with the user groups here if we really bucket into four four elements here um, flexible learning environments uh, aging uh, aging facilities and deferred maintenance aligning facilities with curriculum and focusing on student health and well-being we're going to go through just some of the some of the finer points of each one of these four areas show how some of the facilities uh, are reflecting some of the challenges that they have right now and then we can have a discussion about that when we talk about providing uh, flexible learning environments what we want to make sure is what what we're looking at is that the the current facilities that you have are working as hard as they can for you uh, before we look at expansion or, or before we look at reconfiguration of, of buildings so that's you know what are the furniture solutions that can make that happen what are the other elements that can change within a classroom to make them more functional for uh, for uh, teaching and learning within there you know, adding the, the flexibility uh, within those classrooms allows for rapid reconfiguration or the ease of change 
within that within that space that that teachers are really looking for in order to to change modalities of instruction on a on a, a class by class or inside of a class. So being able to m to have furniture that you can quickly move from direct instruction into small group, um, really important uh, in order to uh, you know free up the ability to do uh, to effectively deliver instructional content to students. And you can see some of the, the classrooms here that, that have, you'll see a, a wide variety um, based on the school, on, on the type of furniture and the type of instructional technology that occurs in there, as well as some of the other elements within the classrooms. You know, you look at the teacher's desk in here, a very fixed position within the classroom. You look at uh, the other elements that, that are taking floor space away from there. We want to analyze that. We want to understand how can we improve the the, uh, the size of the classroom without changing the walls. You know, we, the, we can look at you know removing some of that casework that you see up against the window, or or looking for different treatments for the uh, for the air handling unit that you see in the corner there as well. Um, but these tablet armchair desks, uh, you know, the, they have some challenges in how they're able to come together in groups. And you can see that in this classroom here, uh, because this is a this is set up in a group stand uh, situation right now that's less than ideal for how the students can get together. They also have some challenges when it comes to uh, body posture and body type um, that can really be addressed through a, a different uh, furniture solution within the classroom. That's kind of wanna, where we want to start as a baseline. Understand what what can we do with the uh, the, the most minimum amount of impact financially into each one of the classrooms to improve that environment for the for the teachers. Again, here you'll see a, you see a different type of, of instructional technology. One of our main focus was uh, discussing the idea of standardization of, of instructional technology across the school the schools so that anybody can uh, easily plug in to any one of the, the classrooms as necessary uh, uh, when, when teaching in there. And that's really just a function of the evolution of technology over time why take out a projector when it still works in the classroom just in order to replace it with a, with a, uh, uh, a, a uh, monitor or a screen, but we want to establish a standard again, that, that this is the approach that's going to be developed for each one of the classrooms moving forward so that there is an approach that, that each teacher recognizes and understands. Again, a different uh, furniture approach here, but you can understand the, the challenges with easily being able to move these, uh, these pieces of furniture around into groups as necessary. So, you know, every teacher is going to have a different approach to it, but we want to provide the flexibility that each teacher can be able to use uh, as much as, as well as possible. We talk about deferred maintenance. We know that the buildings are showing their age. Excuse me. Yep. Could we, there's questions between sections. Are you okay with that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So with regard to the, the kind of flexible space utilization, um, just curious about a topic that came up in one of my teacher work group meetings. Uh, there was a mention that the current layout really forces you know, a single large group to use the front of the classroom because that's the only place where there's a writing right. surface. Has there been any discussion of writing surfaces elsewhere in the classroom? Yeah, as we go through this? yeah absolutely. We, we talked, um, you know, one of the things that we want to develop is, the, is get away from having a front to a classroom um, so that there is the ability to have both teachers and students to be able to use whiteboards or, or whatever other interactive capabilities on multiple surfaces within the wall within the classroom we also explored the idea of multiple technology points within a classroom so you can have uh, you can have uh, students set up in groups and still be able to to really have access to that uh, to that instructional uh, technology so that you can be as a teacher be able to be anywhere in the classroom and really present um, and really instruct from those and and no no student is is left either you know forced to to change postures or or change uh, directions in order to access that information so very very much uh, it's not just a furniture solution as you said it's it really is a holistic approach to how the the classroom environment works Deferred maintenance, aging facilities. We know that the fi facilities are, are aging and showing that age, um, both from the physical environment as well as the building systems. You know, everything we heard from teachers isn't about, you know, I want a, a, I want a really, really, uh, you know, high-end, uh, cutting, bleeding-edge classroom. It's about, I want the basics. I want to have the basics th in the classrooms that are improved in order for me to, to, to make the, uh, the best uh, use of the space that I have. You know, the, the idea that, that students really, 
right now are thriving, um, but that is in spite of the facilities, not not because of them. And how can we find a way that the facilities really tie together uh, to improve uh, the student learning experience as well? Um, we also talk about areas that have uh, you know, utilities or have aged beyond their their uh, useful life. Um, you can see here uh, a number of the locker rooms still have large gang type showers, which are taking up uh, large valuable space within those locker rooms. Um, not utilized on a regular basis right now. Is there an opportunity to to move either towards compartmentalized individual showers if that's necessary, or even remove it entirely? So we want to explore all those ideas on, on, on how to make best use of space here. Same thing uh, here at Franklin, um, some of the challenges of the, of the existing locker room uh, from, a, uh, from a privacy, from a observation standpoint, as well as those, uh, those components that have just aged out and are, aren't underutilized as it is right now. Um, accessibility al also becomes a challenge um, along with, uh, with conditions of the facility here. Um, this is a second floor toilet room at, at uh, Edison Middle School um, that just because of the number of, because of the tightness of the space here hasn't been able to be updated to, uh, to accessible standards. There are accessible toilet rooms within Edison, but not all of them meet that standard. So uh, we'd really want to look and make sure that there's universal accessibility uh, throughout the building there. Um, some of the challenges, again, we've talked about uh, the observation challenges uh, that happen in all three schools at specific areas or challenges with student movement. Here uh, at Edison on the second floor, some of the, the biggest challenges happen with student movement into the one stair. Um, it's open on the lower level on the first floor, but has only two entry points on the second floor. Uh, opportunities to open that up to really uh, improve how students move throughout the space. At both Monroe and you'll see later at Franklin, there are uh, there are just from the the uh, evolution of the building, there are areas in the building that create challenges both for student movement as well as for observation, um, where where corridors jog uh, at, and create uh, create site challenges uh, for uh, keeping the tabs on students throughout here. Um, Franklin, we have talked about it at length about what the challenges might be from that, and that continues to, to, to be brought up as well. Aligning facilities with curriculum, this is, uh, you know, this is in direct uh, comparison to the previous topic where we talked about flexibility of space, um, is the facilities were created during an entirely different uh, approach to curriculum delivery, um, when it was mostly or primarily direct instruction. And now we have a blend of direct instruction and different types of teaching styles. Um, the, and the teachers have expressed, you know, they, they, are, they are doing the best they can to, to change modalities of instruction so that students continue to be interested and continue to want to be uh, in class uh, through that flexible use of those, those uh, different opportunities throughout here. So some of the challenges uh, will highlight science specifically at all three schools. Um, you can see that there are some <coughs> size challenges at some at each one of the schools when it comes to science, as well as some of that flexibility challenges. You can see just the the weight and size of the science lab tables here in the middle uh, <laughs> prohibit their them from being able to be moved, so they become a, a, a barrier from uh, really being able to actively move back and forth uh, as an instructor or as a student um, between uh, potential options here and, and really create a static environment within the classroom. Um, also, you saw in the previous, uh, a previous image was, a, uh, was some um, mechanical equipment in those spaces. Those, those uh, cabinet unit heaters tend to have a higher uh, uh, noise uh, than other potential systems that, that affect what students can hear. So the closer you are to, that, to those units, the less and less you're going to perceive, especially at this age level, the less and less you're going to be able to fill those gaps if you miss a word or two uh, within that the teacher is telling you, you're not necessarily going to be able to bridge the, that gap that you that you hear. So, you know, how can we look at the building systems and how they really do affect uh, to affect student instruction? Um, same thing here at, at Monroe and uh, previously at Edison. Uh, some of the challenges within the science lab spaces. That's some. That's why that became a major focus on the, the diagram. Uh, that were developed on how we, how those spaces could be expanded to improve 
and, and to really develop that, that parity for science across curriculum. Student health and well-being. Um, there again, these are these are facilities that were that were designed originally and developed originally um, <coughs> when the the need and the focus for student mental health, uh, student physical health, and social emotional well-being was not as big of a factor. So that has continued to evolve, and uh, spaces have been carved out as much as possible throughout the schools in order to. Uh, to really uh, accommodate those services that are that are vital to the student's uh, well-being, um, the focus really it becomes on developing that that consolidated one-stop shop location for student wellness. And the idea there is that that ha by having all the itinerants in lo one location, there's a good I good ability to triage uh, anything that might be happening. There's a ability to work with teams. You have always somebody who's accessible I within the space. And then you're, we're able to take away any of the potential stigmas by having you know, the nurses, the nurses there, the, the other uh, components are there. So you're not, you're not always being viewed as you know, a negative thing going in there. And I think that just needs to be brought, brought down in general on a, on a societal level too, but, I, but we can't do uh, too much with that. So men mental health is extraordinarily important. So we'll highlight uh, here uh, nurses' offices at each one of the three schools, um, struggling for for space at each school. Um, this the at Franklin here you have uh, you have two uh, two staff workers uh, who uh, share the same space as the cot in this room. Um, this is right at the very front of the building uh, as you come in, um, so it provides uh, you know la some lack of privacy for students as they're coming into the nurses' office. As well as some challenges uh, with the uh, with multiple students who might get into this space. Um, here at Monroe, it's even even larger. If you if if you see during the scan here, there's there's one uh, staff position here, two cots, and uh, as you pan around in the space, you'll see two additional staff positions that that occupy this one location. So you know the I, the the need to separate. Some of these areas have areas for students that that uh, that are not feeling well to be able to be isolated as necessary. You know that's an important thing uh, for for control as well. Same thing at Edison. You know this is this is the former principal's office that has been converted into uh, into the nurse's office here, where there's a, a couple different cots, a couple different staff positions in here, but again right off the front of the building. Um, and the main entry and, and disassociated with uh, student mental health components as well. So, and Monroe here, th they have a, a uh, uh, occupational physical therapy uh, piece that has been added, uh, which is a, a, a well utilized space. The challenge is that it's got a separation from the highest use of these, uh, of these services, which is over in the essentials program. The, the ability to, to have a connection between the essentials program and the itinerants was something that really uh, was, was brought together. Um, that having them in proximity to those services was really important uh, for the ability to bring students as necessary as well as to bring itinerants quickly to uh, the need, uh, to those areas where the students have higher need for their services. So we are continuing through the second, uh, second center bullet of our uh, of our discussion here where we're, where we're planning on scheduling another set of user group meetings where we're going to bring the ideas to them have uh, bring additional information uh, from them through here refine mm -hmm. our our documents and our drawings uh, as well as our project narratives then develop that into uh, what we'll be presenting as a final culmination of this in June um, that will have our full development uh, aligned with a with a budget for the project. Mike, oh, Michael, just re really quickly for, for clarity. So uh, a lot of what we're doing now in terms of the user groups isn't necessarily in a in a like a macro level changing the like the picture designs right, right that we've seen. It's bringing additional detail and clarity to those spaces that have been laid out. Right, That's so right. additional detail to what does a science lab look like with a greater de level of kind of architectural detail that will come back to the board when those plans come back in May and June. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, and um, you know, there are areas where we're going to shift pieces around here or there, but it's not a wholesale, let's, you know, scrap it and start over. This is a, 
this is a we have a plan that's moving forward it's been well thought out it's been vetted with the schools on a number of different occasions let's add the detail that we need to get to get where we need to go with it thank you board any questions which stakeholder groups or constituencies are now part of those user group meetings uh, I don't I don't is know. It, is it solely teachers? Is it teachers and administration? Are students included? We've had teachers and, and administrators as part of this. Um, we're, we're working on uh, how best to incorporate the student voice from our last conversation as well uh, to see what the best approach to that is. Uh, I think uh, some refinement of that on this age group is something that we're, we're trying to, to figure out the best, best approach to that right now. Anyone else? I'll say I'll say it's yes. It, it'll be both of that. We'll have updated drawings. that will have more detail than just the bubble diagrams that you saw previously. Um, we'll have uh, both. Um, we'll have three-dimensional representations of the spaces, uh, the major component spaces. We'll look at you know general prototype uh, approaches to that, as well as some specific elements at each one of the schools, and then uh, an overall project narrative that that goes through a descriptor. Of uh, you know what what and why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you. That's helpful. The reason I ask is uh, a few months ago we had a training session at Hubble on Lewis and Ada Floor, which I had a chance to go on a tour of there. Um, and when you were going through the pictures and talking about some of the struggles, like in the language uh, classes, where you want students talking to one another to practice the skills, you can see how some collaboration might be difficult there. And you could see at that newer school how the educational performance could be there. So I think a visual of seeing what we're moving towards is very helpful. Great, thank you. And sort of following up on that, when we're discussing the physical layout in terms of adapted furniture or whiteboards, so, so how, how do we come to the choice of what is chosen for those physical layouts? Like is, is staff visiting other districts that have implemented some of these like how do we know what's best yeah um, what we bring is some uh, some of the experience that we have with other similar institutions um, there's a whole stage after this where, where we'll continue to have discussions with users as as we get into more and more refined uh, uh, project and uh, you know when we're when we're looking at uh, specific components within those classrooms we'll have those more and more specific in, uh, uh, meetings with that is, and we can go out and we can see what other other districts are doing at that point too. So this is this is uh, still you know as we're uh, we're at the macro stage, getting a little bit further. We'll keep on adding and layering in that. At Los Angeles, so, some of the, the teachers though, just as we met with some of the user groups, they brought ideas like that. So I mean, they they have they have colleagues, they have friends that teach at other schools that have been more recently updated renovated and, and in a number of cases they not not to say this is exactly what we want but they brought some visuals to say right this is what you know a, a kind of a, a flexible lab station might look like and, and in some of those cases we're actually going out to visit a few of those sites as well as they share the, the ideas so um, yeah I, I think it'll uh, a lot of those those pieces the the finishings right there's a uh, you know, even even as uh, uh, Dr. O'Keefe worked with uh, our library learning center teams, when we get to the to the kind of far end finishing conversations, we'll have an opportunity to go as far as actually like looking at furniture, testing out some of those pieces. But that's down the road, down the road. Uh, that that's not still kind of concept level. I think the goal here and, and what Michael's talking about and even bringing it forward is to bring a level of detail to the drawing that gives you great confidence in the cost estimates that are built. So enough information to formulate whatever information we need to put in front of the community for decisions that they have to make. But then there's a whole even deeper level of design development that's potentially going to happen after that. Anyone else? One, oh, one more question. Um, 
specifically with thinking more of Franklin and Edison with the age of their buildings, is there a point at which, and I don't have a background in this to know legally, um, at which we are making significant enough changes that the, the requirements under ADA like push us into doing more? Is that? Yeah, uh, there is. Um, we, ha we will continue to study that. I think, w well I think one of the, the major things that, that both Monroe and at Franklin is to understand what are the, the barrier challenges um, to getting into the building. There are some mm -hmm. significant pieces within there. Um, we've also identified, you know, as we were talking about at Edison, there are, there are specific areas within the building um, that have accessibility challenges, but there is, ADA has a specific trigger that says that you need to, if you've renovated a certain percentage of a building, now you need to apply it to everything. Um, but as we're looking at the buildings, we want to make sure that we're, we're using universal design principles so that we're making uh, the, the buildings as accessible as possible with or without that trigger. Okay, if we anticipated that we weren't reaching that trigger, could we accidentally reach that trigger? Not that, I mean, I agree with you that everything should be accessible. Right. But with the age of the buildings and some of the difficulties <coughs> and complications that may arise, there may be some things that are much more costly and difficult to address. Sure. Like, is there potential there that we could trigger something that's going to open a can of worms? And the, there, there always is, but there's also a, a, a hardship um, uh, exception to that, okay. depending on what level that is at. Um, so we'll have to we'll have to look at that throughout the the facilities as we as we get to it. I think. Okay, just concerned that we could see quite a sure. escalation in costs that we weren't anticipating. So I just want to. It's good to know there's a hardship clause. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, I guess, take exception with the term of uh, deferred maintenance that in my mind implies some neglect of things that should have been done in previous years and as I see it a lot of what we are characterizing as deferred maintenance is just simply these things have worn out they you, know, you can refinish a floor you can refinish a floor you can refinish a floor now you got to replace the floor right and in my mind that's not deferred maintenance it just wore out sure. so I to me the term deferred maintenance suggests neglect of of uh, past management, and I would debate that. No, point well, point well made, thank you. The, the other thing that I would say is if we follow the right process, we're going to get to the best possible answer, and I really like the fact that we're talking to people uh, that are using the facilities, that are living in them, and getting ideas that are being sifted by people that have been through this before, like, like you and like our superintendent and other staff here. Uh, we've, we're bringing the best possible process to this whole thing, so that we're going to come out with, I think, the best uh, the best possible result. So, thank you. Well, just <coughs> following on that comment, I know you touched <coughs> on it earlier, but I do think it's important we find out how to incorporate the student voice in that. Um, and I don't know if the right answer is the students who just came out of that environment while the recollection's fresh, or the students mm -hmm. that have had a little bit more time to to process and understand what good looks like, but I do think their voice is important in this. Sure, thank you. Uh, I, I, I have one question. Uh, as you were going through, I know we're, f we're continuing to refine. Uh, any, any l not surprises, but aha moments that we might need to change some of the thoughts and the preliminary designs? Um, I think some of the, the um we still have some. We still have some things that we need to uh, to really come to a conclusion to. Uh, I think one of the one of the main things that we talk about is at Edison. Um, there's still a desire to have the science all mm -hmm. co-located as much as possible. Um, we've talked through that. We're we're continuing to develop what that might look like. Um, there were some discussions around mm -hmm. what what does the what does the uh, wellness uh, component look like there as well, and how does that tie in with that same discussion. Um, those were interesting points uh, we worked through. I think, you know, one of the things that, that that's going to continue to evolve and and really understand is what what is science going to look like, what and science science what what is that going to look like, and and um, you know, bringing in the the curriculum, the district side curriculum approach alongside of the the instructors from each one of the schools is really going to help us 
sort of understand what what is the the current uh, approach and what is going to be the future for that. Um, I'm really excited fr- by 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 the possibility that comes from that, um, as well as the idea of uh, of some of the exploratory labs, as well as the the, Im- the improvements in general. Um, but you know, we we uh, we're we're really interested in in what the what the discussions hold. Um, two things that I just want to mention with that. So uh, I guess maybe a little bit of an aha through this process. So uh, I, I don't know that we necessarily thought of it connected to the facility redesign, uh, but but it is a good thing that Melissa and her team have done the amount of curriculum work that they've done over the last couple of years, because really in every kind of core department within the, the middle school, we've had that instructional design conversation. So teams of teachers have been together as a part of the curriculum process. So there actually was a lot of alignment as you talked with math, as you talked with ELA and, and even social studies on like how rooms needed to work aligned to the curriculum piece. We haven't done as much curriculum work in science at the, the middle school. So Melissa and her team are going to play a little bigger role in that conversation, not necessarily redoing curriculum right now, but, but really having a role in talking about what the science look like as we look ahead 10 years so that we make sure that the labs that we design now are labs that are not out of date in five years. And, and so uh, that's something that uh, Melissa and, and her team are going to work on and, and candidly tap into the high schools to help us with as well because we've used the high school department chairs to support that curriculum design process in the other departments. And I think there's a good opportunity to, to do that. So I think science is definitely one area where just on our side, we've got to do a little more work in the design of the lab so that you know we're we're thoughtful on it. The, the only other thing I was going to say, Rob, that, that may have been even a little bit of an aha for, for me and, and even Brian as we sat through those three days as well, uh, you, you do have staff that are working really hard in spaces that do have some current challenges and limitations. A- and I'm just talking about things like mechanical systems, noise, some lighting structures. There, there are, there are some phys- whatever you want to call it. You know, John, I he- certainly hear your point, but uh, we we just have some facilities that are showing their age, and I think are probably showing them at even a higher level than than I knew that they were until we brought the staff together that really articulated some of the challenges they're seeing on a daily basis inside of their space. So they did not come together and say you know, absolutely, like, design me the classroom of the future with every bell and whistle we could possibly imagine. They were thoughtful in the instructional (laughs) feedback, but really came to say that there are some basic infrastructure things that have to be addressed. And and I I guess I share that to say, I think even as we worked with the community and did some of the community engagement and kind of identified like a low, medium, high range at the onset, I think we were low with the low. I think there's actually probably a lot more that at a very bare minimum would need to get done than what we even, I think, reflected in kind of what we previously characterized. Now, the good news is the community feedback that didn't really entertain the low. They expressed a desire for us to address the facilities. But but I, you know, I, I don't know that I've really clearly said that. I just think the need is more significant than perhaps I even realized in spending three days really listening to staff at a very deep level. We, we heard that in a way that I just want to express to you, I think, an urgency that's being felt in those buildings that says, I don't think anybody around this table is questioning the need to do something, but I think that urgency is even a little stronger than that. Yeah, I'll tell you my two takeaways from tonight. One is that theme where I'm not looking for a Jetsons kind of experience. I'm looking for basics, right? That's a pretty big statement from our teachers. Um, You know, we've been in the classrooms. We've all been there. Um, But to hear it from them and to get that, right? The second one that struck me, and I've not been in these spaces, is our wellness areas. I was kind of shocked by what I saw. And and, and I'm not looking for the ER either. It's just something they're so compact, and they're trying to do the best they can. But, yeah, that needs to be addressed for sure. I'm glad to hear that on the list. Thank you. 
I say, I love being on the other side of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, first off, I think you've done a great job working through this process. I love the themes. Um, <clears throat> I also think the board, your comments and questions have been spot on. So there's a reason I'm talking last on these kinds of topics. Um, so I'm going to talk kind of big picture. If you remember back in, I think it was January, we reviewed a kind of a, a worksheet, 10 ideas of, of things that I thought you needed to piece together to kind of create the whole kind of a whole solution and the whole story. And so the idea of going from January to June, I think we're right on track. I think we're touching all the issues that we need to touch. Uh, I like the communication we just sent out to the community, I think it was yesterday. Um, <coughs> So we're still a little, little bit of work to do. You know, we're still at a very high level on some of these concepts. We're still concept, not not really detailed design. There's lots of opportunity over the next year to get into the details and have more feedback from a community level standpoint, from a teacher level standpoint, from a student standpoint. But the more we can do to kind of put as much meat on the bone with good details and thinking about how it's going to be constructed and having a good solid budget, I think it's a I think it's a well-conceived uh, implementation of a process to date, and I think the next two months are really going to bring kind of a little bit more, um, bring the crystal ball into focus. So I think uh, you know June's going to be a big, big meeting for us. So thanks for your feedback. Thanks for the board uh, input, and uh, that's all I have to say. All right, thank you, board. All right, I'll thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, Mr. I'll Mr. add one Ryan. thing. So one of the things I think that we all have maybe heard from the community is, um, you know, this was good enough for my kids, you know, they can learn with a desk and a piece of paper, you know, like, why do we need to do some of these things? And I think we see that delivery style has changed. But also when you talk about environment, and you think about like, right now, I can hear the fan over there. And we seem to have, in this decade, going forward, more students with sensitivities to some of those sensory inputs. And if they can't concentrate or attend um, because the lighting is too too much, too overwhelming. And really, students neurologically are different than they were back in the day. So why it may have worked 100 years ago to have like a single classroom schoolhouse, um, kids are different today. And so I think there is value in the environment that they're in. So that's just my little Thank addendum. You, uh, I'll just add one point, and I think this is a comment I made in January, that don't forget, we have to create the right uh, environment for the teachers to do their best work and to deliver the curriculum and the learning experience we want our students to have. We are in a competitive environment when we are kind of recruiting and trying to retain teachers, and, and I believe, and I've seen it, the environment matters for these teachers, um, and we need to be in a position where we can go get the kinds of teachers we want and uh, the talent we need to, you know, do the best work for the students and what the community expects. So don't forget that aspect of kind of kind of the physical condition of these buildings. I'll just close by saying you heard a lot on program development today. Uh, two of the great out areas uh, when when Michael kind of went through the the opening budget development and implementation, those are the two things we're going to focus on in May uh, for you. So we will bring to you an updated budget uh, number in May based on kind of where we are, where it's going to be even at a greater level of, of level of detail than it is today. And we will bring you an implementation plan for each of the three buildings. So a sense of based on what the concepts look like, how we would anticipate, where we would anticipate starting and how long to, to get through. Uh, each of the, the three projects. So those are the two updates you're going to see at your May meeting, and then June, it will all come together. Again, you just saw us uh, uh, aboard the recent communication that uh, Alyssa worked and, and sent out. Um, Alyssa is continuing to work on, uh, I think, what, what she kind of mapped out for Facilities Committee before in like a, like a Facility Friday series. So as we get to the end of the year and have really put a level of detail, um, we're envisioning a 10 plus kind of part series to really <coughs> unpack elements of the plan and make sure we bring clarity on, you know, so that the community has a really good understanding of what are we doing, how much is it costing, and how does that benefit students a lot of what we've talked about today. But we want to kind of un unpack that, you know, into 
the components of the, the project. We've also set aside some dates right at the end of this school year for some additional open house, and we will return to those in the fall uh, so that what we're doing at the end of the year isn't the, the last time we're also going to have some open house opportunities for the, the community. So we, we have kind of a, I guess what, what you would call is a constant stream of communication, multiple <coughs> modalities planned between now and uh, end of the, the summer as well. In the implementation, or probably in the implementation development plan, we just have that lens about safety. So that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no discussion items tonight. We are on to board committee reports. So the facilities committee met on April 3rd, and the notes were attached. Uh, Mr. Paulson, any additional comments? Not from what we just talked about, only in that we also covered the summer 2024 capital facility work. There was a little bit of work done over spring break at a couple of our schools, some prep work. So uh, we were able to get in the buildings, get a little bit advanced work done so that we have a little bit more, uh, maybe relieve some of the pressure in the summer, which is always a really busy time doing that amount of work in the summer. So that was the other kind of other topic piece that's highlighted a little bit in the minutes. I think we should just mention we also did take advantage of spring break to take advantage of some additional sound work at Wheaton Warrenville South. That's a, an issue I think the board heard about uh, a few times. So Brian was able to accelerate uh, getting some of that work done over spring break. Great. Board Finance Committee met on April 4th, and those notes were attached. Mr. Long, any additional comments? <coughs> so the um, additional topics besides transportation, we talked about the um, – the audit and we approved a one-year extension of the uh, contract with Baker Tilly. Um, we didn't look beyond a year because this at the end of this year that will be five years and at the end of five years we typically would go out to an R with an RFP um, just kind of a, a best practice and then um, as any updates relative to the um, uh, cash flow the, the payments of taxes is it consistent with what we talked about last week so I'll yeah, so just that, that with all the um, all the taxing bodies doing a software update, tax bills are going out late and receipts to the district are going to be late. Um, <clears throat> we don't feel like it's likely, but there is a possibility that in June we might have to do um, a borrowing, and if we had to do that, that would require some board action. But, um, you know, as of last week, um, Dr. O'Keefe felt pretty confident that wasn't going to be the case, but we just want to put it out there so that it's not a surprise if all of a sudden at the end of May we find out we've got an issue that we got to deal with. And that's a standard process we, we've used in the past? We, we haven't used it in the past because we haven't had to do it. So again, what I think Dave's just talking about is tax collections are late. Tax collections are late. They're going to come to the school district late, and it has the potential not just for District 200, but lots of districts to create a tax flow or to create yeah. a cash flow issue in you know any district that is reliant on certainly early taxes or that first distribution. So right. we haven't had to do it because we haven't encountered this Not issue and, and you know Brian and Jordan are watching the pennies very closely to Yep. And we we did talk a little bit about what we just covered on middle school, so there's nothing else to add there. Got anything else? Just um, two points that I, I found interesting in that cash flow discussion. Um, one, just for, for clarity, um, when we talk about a potential borrowing option, that isn't fund-to-fund -fund borrowing within our own uh, structure. That's external borrowing. Um, and then the second thing is wearing my private sector hat, I'd pose the question of, well, can we delay payables to, to help bridge this? Um, our ability to do that's a little different than perhaps in the private sector due to the Illinois Prompt Pay Act. Good question, though. I get it. All right. Anything else? Okay. Uh, the board, H, uh, the HR policy committee met on April 4th. Busy day, apparently. Uh, notes were attached. Ms. Cullivis. Yeah, so we are wrapping up our review of the administrative procedures. There was one minor section that just uh, – two procedures uh, that uh, we missed down Section 8, and then there are a few operative procedures that we didn't wrap up through the crack, cracks that we're going to wrap up and review. Um, we also discussed uh, the social media guideline administrative procedure that the district has been developing throughout this year. Um, so uh, Angela and I are going to take some time and review that and provide some feedback at our next meeting. Um, and then we also, there's uh, the latest issue of press came out. 
um, there's really just one main policy relating to illegal chain, uh, uh, change in the law on discrimination reporting that we're going to be reviewing that in a couple of days. That was perfect. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, just a quick question, oh, and I know it's been answered here before, but a community member asked me this week, and I couldn't remember the answer. The numbering scheme in our policies, remind me again what is press standard versus something we've tailored versus something that's unique to our district? Yeah, if it typically if it ends with a zero or a five, uh, it is a common pre press has some version of that policy. If it ends with any number other than a zero or a five, it is probably a locally developed policy. Usually those end with a two. You'll see a handful of them that end with a two. That is a District 200 uniquely developed policy. Board, any other reports? Okay. All right, we have four written reports. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry, John. I comment if this is the time to do it. Involvement with several boys schools recently. I spent an afternoon at uh, Jefferson, had a great time with the kids there. I went out to um, Sterling to see the uh, Wheaton North drama group put on Badger. I couldn't go to Danville the same night because I'm not cloned, but both uh, both schools won. And then I went back the following weekend, Friday night, to see Badger again in the finals. And the next morning, bright and early, for uh, lost girl from South. And uh, so that was three trips to Sale uh, to uh, Sterling in about a week. Uh, I uh, uh, enjoyed the Coral Classic here, which I'm sure has been mentioned before. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be at uh, Washington to hear the kindergarten kids do their nursery rhymes. And I think it's the 27th or 29th. I will be doing the 5K at Lowell, and I encourage you <laughs> to join me for that. That's a pass. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> wow. You guys hired your fifth year. Yeah. You're giving Bob Rammer a run for his money. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention that my family and I had a chance to go to the cabaret that, uh, the show choir cabaret that Kaylee mentioned, and I just wanted to recognize uh, the, those choirs that are in the high school, uh, two of their show choirs, and then also the middle school, and they just did a fantastic job. <coughs> um, um, and I just wanted to mention to the board, I, I've uh, taken the opportunity to attend the last two IASB um, advocacy meetings. Um, I think it's very worthwhile time if anyone can carve out the time to attend those just to get a bit of a preview at um, potential upcoming legislation, as well as understanding the, the perspective that the ISB brings to that legislation and their recommendations. Thank you. And then I got two quick ones. Um, two consecutive Thursdays, we, my wife and I went and saw the Wheaton North show choir flight, their like home show, so very entertaining and good. And the following Thursday was the, I wanna get the name right, talent show of the tiger crew and flock and um so that was at wheaton north the following thursday and that is um that is really um heartwarming to see those kids up on stage just uh living it up and and um you know some of them that was like their moment it was uh, really a um, inspiring show all right thank you uh we have four written reports that were provided to the board uh, that are on the agenda or on the website the monthly financial reports, our FOIA report, our board communication log, and our citizen advisory committee report. We have two topics for future discussion, the comprehensive update on safety, security, and wellness, and student wellness, and also the middle school facilities plan. Uh, board, are there any other topics you want considered for future discussion? All right, hearing none. Our next regular board meeting will be on May 8th at 7 o'clock at the School Service Center. Uh, the board, uh, the next coffee with the board will be on April 20th, 2024 at 9 a.m. at the School Service Center. And our next Committee to the Whole will be on April 24th at 7 o'clock at the School Service Center. Uh, we are going to be uh, going to close session. Um, Excuse me, Rob. Yep. Um, don't we have some preliminary thoughts on the topics for that upcoming committee of the whole that we could share with the community here, or is it too early to do that? Uh, I th I th I'm not sure what we're you're asking. I thought we were having the safety focus at that next committee of the whole. Well, yeah, that's what's on there. It's on the future discussion. That's the, the comprehensive update on safety, security, student wellness. But that would occur on April 24th? Yeah, okay. that's at the committee of the whole. Yeah, I was just trying to connect it to the Got meeting. It. Yep. 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 Real good. Thanks for the clarity. Yeah. Okay. All 
All right, we're going to be moving to closed session, so board, I need a motion and a second to adjourn to closed session pursuant to the Illinois Open Meetings Act, Exemption 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 Part C Part 1 and 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 Part C Part 10. So moved. Moved Sorry. by Mr. Paulson, second by second. Mr. Rutledge. All right, Ms. Hutchison, will you please call the roll? Yes. 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 Yes, our meeting is clo uh, adjourned to closed session. There is no action expected following our closed session. Thank you. Have a good evening.